Everybody, everybody, man, I got to say it quietly and and try to do it smoothly, expeditiously, maybe, uh, conscientiously, and all them leads. You had Anthony Brogdon at Strong Inspirations Lee. And man, I'm ladies out there, you watching me. I got a guy on the channel that I did not sleep last night uh, thinking about this. I, he can't hear me. I, I ain't lying to you. I, 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 now, hold on. Let me say this. And I say this all the time when I got people like him on the channel. I ain't put no guest over any other. All of them come on here and share their heart with you, my viewers. Uh, but 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 when you hear the circumstance from which I'm talking about today, you will understand. Um, hit the subscribe button on Strong Inspiration. I don't know what you're waiting on, and it's free. It don't cost no money. We don't ask no questions. It just let me know you like me, and I know you do. Because you, there's no way you can't like what I'm trying to do for you, my friends, and for me, because I get a lot out of this. I'm a whole lot smarter since uh, Strong Inspirations. Uh, hit, the, hit the like button on this video. I know you're going to like it. He's going to put something on you. I'm telling you, he's going to give it to you straight, no chaser. You're going to be completely, in, matter of fact, when you watch this, don't drive. <laughs> don't get out your car and drive. Don't watch it in your car because it's going to blow your mind. You're going to be like, you're going to have to pull over. Watch that. Stop. Just, I ain't playing with y'all. Watch. And 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 then and hit the notifications bell when the videos come up because uh, I, I put them up anytime and I don't know when I'm going to put this one up, but it's going to hit my heart and there it is. But you can watch them at any point. Tell somebody about strong inspirations. Don't keep it to yourself acting like you know everything and you just watched it on the channel. Don't do that. No, come on. Now let it flow. The train has left the station and it's people like my guest today. Oh my God. Uh, 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 how about this? And, 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 and this is in line with my guest. Uh, I'm gonna give you, it's a kind of hint. I got Madam CJ Walker's great, great granddaughter on here. Did you watch that video? I got Ida B. Wells great grandson on here. Did you watch that video? I got Pete, I got a guy that went to the KKK rally down in uh, Florida, him and his four of his buddies. Cause and, and I when I was gonna ask him the question, I was thinking I was gonna make a funny thing out of it. Cause you know you go, you, it ain't gonna be good. I said, man, why did you go? He said, because I wanted to protect other black people because we didn't know how vicious they were gonna be the next day when we went out and marched. That was the whole motivation. And we got close. We had a back road, but they caught us. Took us to the meet, and 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 you, everybody, as you can imagine, I'm talking to him. So he survived. Got beat. Watch that video. Did you, chat, uh, did you see the one I just put out about the lady in London, England, who is the president of the U UK Society of Genealogists? She said, "Now that I'm in the road, black people, come on, get some of this information." Because it was all for the white people looking, you know, Aristotle's and all them and kings and queens. They were using it to figure out their situation and overlooking, I'm sure, the part that they did to the brothers and sisters. She said, no, I'm, I'm sharing this. Watch that video. Oh, we jamming at the channel. I'm not playing with you. And my guest today, I'm telling you, <laughs> yo, I, I'm not playing with you. Little old me, I'm not little no more as a result of this guest and all the others. Who've come on the channel? I'm so excited! I got my own festival. I want y'all to come down. It's a thousand of y'all. I can take. I can handle that. It's in Kansas City, Kansas. The slaves walked across the Missouri River when it froze, and they took a boat in the summertime. However, they got across to Kansas City, Kansas. Ended up in Quindaro. We're gonna picnic on the site where they were. We're gonna walk where they walked. Uh, that's Memorial Day weekend. I want y'all there. It's very reasonable price, and that includes food. All right? I want y'all to come there. Everybody you might know, I'm a filmmaker. I'm serious about my game. I'm elevating folk in my own way. It's called Business in the Black, and it's streaming on Amazon. We talk about this guest 
great, great, uh, might be two greats or something like that, grandfather in the movie. And how about this? We talk about him because he was a businessman in the movie. In the early days, I'm going to hit you up like this. It was a newspaper. Boom, shakalaka. And then we really talk about him in this book that I wrote called Black Business Book. Now, my man's smiling, but I got to go through my routine. <laughs> I got to tell y'all, get you a copy of this. I'm not playing. This thing going to go down in history because it's easy to read. I ain't no big reader. You can give me the fact in about three, four sentences, I got it. Now, I want to learn more, I look it up. <laughs> That's how the book is. And I tell you where to look it up in the back. It's over 200 of them facts. You hear me use that term strong a lot? It's my favorite word, which defines my guest today. My guest today in particular. And strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. And that is my introduction to my man today. Um, now come on, introduce yourself. Thank you for coming on Strong Inspirations. Oh, Anthony, it's my pleasure to be with you finally. I've been wanting to come on your show for a long time, so I'm happy oh, to be God. here. <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I have too, and uh, I'm glad you're here. Uh, what, what, tell us your name. Well, um, my name is Kenneth B. Morris Jr., and um, I am the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass, the person you were talking about, publisher, journalist of the North Star newspaper out of Rochester, New York. And I'm also the great, great grandson of founder and educator of Tuskegee Institute, now Tuskegee University, Booker T. Washington. And I heard you trying to count up all of those greats. I know it's, there, there are a lot of them. So it's, it's not only a mouthful, trying to say all of those greats when I introduce myself to people, but it sometimes makes me feel like I'm far removed. And, and you might be sitting there having a hard time trying to imagine what my connection is to Douglas and Washington. It's like trying to picture what a billion dollars looks like with so many zeros. But many people know a grandparent. Um, you may have even known a great grandparent. And that's how close I feel to both of my ancestors because you see my great grandmother, Fanny Douglas, to whom I was very close. She lived to be 103 years old. And she met Frederick Douglass when she was a little girl. And my Aunt Portia, to whom I was also very close, lived to be 95, and she was Booker T. Washington's daughter. Okay, hold and on. I remember hold being on. a little interrupt. boy. I don't mean no disrespect. How about this? Now, let's go back over it from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, Frederick Douglass, how many greats? Three greats. Great, Three great, greats. great. And Booker T. Washington, two greats? Two greats. Okay, let's get to the heart of it. Frederick Douglass's son married Booker T. Washington's daughter? No, no, no. So the way that it happened, it was on my mother's side of the family. So you ready? Yeah. You ready for this? Yep. Okay. Yep. So my mother's mother, Nettie Hancock Washington, was Booker T. Washington's granddaughter. My mother's father, Frederick Douglass III, was Frederick Douglass's great grandson. And so my grandparents met in 1941 at Tuskegee. Uh, they happened to be on campus the same day my grandfather was a surgeon and he had been commissioned down there by the Veterans Administration during World War II. My grandmother had been born on campus, but she was living in California at the time, home, just home for summer vacation. And so she was on campus to meet friends. She's rushing across to get to the other side to meet those friends. My grandfather decided this one evening that he was going to eat in the student cafeteria where he had never eaten before. So if you can get this visual of these two people rushing across campus and they literally bumped into each other, didn't know that the other descended from an historic family. They fell in love at first sight and wound up getting married three months later. And so when my mother oh, was born, really? Nettie Washington Douglas, she was the first person to unite the bloodlines and she was an only child. So I have the honor and privilege and blessing to be the first male to carry the dual lineage. So, so that's how it happened. It happened on my mother's side. Oh, it was a kind okay, of meant to be, it was a love story. Understand. So now, is he older than her? Is, is who older than, than uh, she? Your great grandfather that married Booker T. Washington's. No, 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 no. So they're, so they're, they're both students. Well, no, they weren't students. So my, my grandfather was a surgeon and he was down there um, during World War II, he was commissioned down there by the Veterans Administration. So he's my 30 mother, years old, something like that. Yeah, yeah, well, something, something like that. So, okay. but Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington were different generations. Frederick That's was born what I'm getting at. That's in 1818, what I'm getting at. and Booker T. Washington was born in 1956. So that's the difference in the great, great, great. So my okay. grandparents were 
virtually the same age, but they were different generations. Within I the got family. you. Yeah. I got you. And, and so he looked up and, uh, and, and, and she good looking and everything like that. So he said, she looks like a movie and, star. And, I mean, she looks, if you, you can do a Google search, Nettie Hancock, Washington, and um, you'll see pictures of her. She looked like a movie star. She was a fashionista. She was actually a poster girl for the Tuskegee Airmen. She was a poster, a poster girl for um, Philip Morris cigarettes back in the day. And she was, really? a, she was an entertainer, performer too, and an educator. She was an educator just like Booker T. Washington. Okay, okay, hold on. Let's go back here. We're going to stay on this just a second and we can go to the rest. Booker T. Washington is a good looking guy. Hey, you know, we've and got his wife good is a good looking lady. <laughs> Thank you. See him over my shoulder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's a good looking. We always thought that. And and yeah. his wife was a good looking lady and they got good looking. And then so is Frederick Douglass. He's a good looking guy. Most photographed uh, American the of the 19th afro. century. He, he always had the big afro. Well, he had a, he had a lot of different hairstyles. He certainly was known for a lot of things um, as well as his hair. But yeah. he was the most photographed American of the 19th century. He was photographed more than President Lincoln, more than Ulysses S. Grant, more than General Custer, because he understood that this new technology that he would come of age with, photography he could use uh, in addition to his oratory and his writings to make his arguments for liberation and equality. So at the age of 22, just two years removed from slavery, he was smart enough to understood, understand that he could use this technology and he did it very successfully. Uh, there were more than 168 photographs of him that, that we found when we published our first edition of Picturing Frederick Douglass, which was the book that we made the case that he was the most photographed American. Well, what, and what his only contemporary- that, that They taking pictures in 1800s though. Uh, that, well, yeah. Them, yeah it was, you see um, with the shade over it and everything well, you yeah, think? <laughs> yeah, with the shade over it. Yeah. And um, you know, you, you had to sit there a long time for that, that exposure to happen. So I, I actually had an opportunity uh, last month, uh, there was a series, 1000 Years of Slavery. And um, in the fourth episode, uh, we touched on Frederick Douglass's photography legacy. And I had an opportunity to sit down in New York and take a photograph uh, with one of those old tintype uh, technology cameras. And, and that was a really interesting process to see how uh, they took those photographs and then to go into the dark room and develop it. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, let me divert from that to you though, before, cause I'm gonna stay on, the, on that on the, on the bulk of, the, uh, of our interview. Where did you grow up? I was born in Washington, D.C. and um, spent time in D.C. as a kid, also in Rockville, Maryland. Um, I spent all of my summers at Frederick Douglass' Summer Beach House, which was a retirement home that was built by my great-great-grandfather, Charles. So Frederick and Anna Murray Douglass' youngest son, Charles, uh, purchased acreage on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay, and he uh, parceled them out, sold them off as lots and he kept a couple, uh, he kept one for his family, one for his brother, and then one to build a retirement home for his father, Frederick Douglass. And he asked his dad, you know, are there any special features that you want in the house? And Frederick said, yes, I want it to point in a certain direction. I want there to be a tower at the top. And what he wanted to do at the end of his life was sit in that tower, look back across the water, back across the Chesapeake Bay, because on the other side, you could see land and that land was the eastern shore of Maryland where he had been born into slavery and where he had toiled away in chains. And so I spent all of my summers in that home. And then um, at some point when I was older, I'm um, trying to remember is probably about 10 years old, uh, my family moved to California, which is where I live now. Um, okay. But I've lived in a lot of places. I've lived yeah. in Chicago, I've lived in Atlanta, I've lived in um, yeah. Yeah, San Francisco, you know, okay. a lot of places. Then now, now the house in Anacosta, what house is that? That was the house that Frederick spent the last 17 years of his life. It's now the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site run by the National Park Service. The Park Service took it over in 1962, which was the year that I was born. So I've spent, when I was a kid, uh, we used to go on field trips to that house. And so I've spent my whole life actually going to that home. I was just there a couple of weeks ago. So the house... That house there, he, uh, he eventually sold, and, uh, and they then I was a historical site. None of the family ever lived in that but him. No, well, he he passed away in the house. Um, he had oh, a heart really? attack in in the um, in the entryway. Right, if you if you ever have a chance to go to it, it's a very yeah. inspirational place. I recommend that all of your your viewers uh, go to that home and and check it out. But yeah, he um, passed away in the house, and then his second wife, Helen Pitts. Um, took it over. And then eventually she, she had the vision 
uh, to turn it into a, a memorial, a place um, like a um, Mount Vernon or Thomas Jefferson's Montecito. Yeah, it is. So she sure. understood that he, you know, he was a second uh, founding father of the Second Republic. And so she was very instrumental in making sure um, that that house would be preserved. And she started the Frederick Douglass Memorial and Historical Association, which is still in existence today. It's the oh. oldest Frederick Douglass or organization. Okay, yeah, yeah, because I've been to the house and it, hey, it's gorgeous. It's sitting on top of the hill, like you can see all of the uh, over to Washington. the DC and everything. Yeah, yeah, he knew how to pick a piece of property. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, did. and so, um, as you said, that he, you know, was in his uh, 20s and whatnot. How did, how did, um, okay, no, let me, let me, let me leave that. So you grew up. Let, let's say, can, can I say you grew up privileged behind this? Uh, well, a little different. I would say, yeah, I, I, private I, I get, schools for yourself, that kind of thing. No, no, I, I grew up middle class, um, but there is definitely some privilege in being a descendant of two of this country's greatest and influential yeah. heroes. But no, we didn't grow up with a lot of money, but not everybody had a, an opportunity to spend summers at a beach house either. Right. So, um, yeah, I definitely would say that there's was some privilege, but yeah. it wasn't, you know, when you the legacy of, of slavery in this country and and it wasn't that long ago, you know, I talked about my great, great, great grandmother, excuse me, my great grandmother and my my aunt Portia, who was Booker T. Washington's daughter. And both of them met, you know, my my Fanny met Frederick Douglass and Portia met her father. And so I'm just one person. Yeah. away from each man and I'm yeah, one right. person away from slavery. So right. that generational trauma that's been passed down through 400 years of oppression and, and enslavement, um, you know, so it's not like there was there was a lot of money um, that was passed down. No, no. Oh, really? Yeah. But 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 now he but like to your family, yeah, going to the beach house, did or did, did they have to fear for now this is get right to the heart of did they have to fear for their life for some reason being associated with him? Well, you know, so I was I was born, as I said, in 1962. So we're we're talking about the 60s and we know what was going on in the country yeah. with the civil rights movement. And many of the people that had homes at Highland Beach, um, they were well to do people, um, African-Americans. They were lawyers. They were doctors. Okay, they were professionals. Right. They were business people. And it was a place where they could take their families um, away from the racism that existed in, in Washington, DC. So there was really this kind of um, protective bubble um, in growing up in that, in that beach uh, community. And, and just, you know, and, and that was something that, that my parents and all of those people wanted to protect their kid, kids from. So it was something that I do feel very fortunate to have um, that upbringing. Did did, did 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 do you did you grow up with other famous kids uh, kids of other famous people? Well, <laughs> I wouldn't say that I necessarily grew up with um, famous kids of other people. Yeah. But um, I certainly had an opportunity to meet uh, a lot of people growing up. You know, musicians and and movie stars and and, and that sort of thing. Because they but, would come uh, to the house. Yeah, they would they would come out to the beach house okay. or, um, you know, if there was a Frederick Douglass or Booker T. Washington event, some sort of dedication, um, you know, bridge dedication or library or school dedication. Uh, as a kid, I'd have an opportunity to go to those things. And a lot of times there would be, uh, you know, very influential people that would be a part it, of those. It, about this one. When you grew up, did you tell somebody you were your, your, your family tree, uh, get a girl that way or something <laughs> like that? Is that? I actually, I was I was very uh, shy um, <laughs> when I was growing up, so I probably could have used that to my benefit, but I but I never did because the few times that I told people of my relationship or told my friends or my classmates, nobody ever believed me. Oh and really? So, yeah, I never thought that it was a point worth worth arguing. So it wasn't something that um, I talked a lot about, and I had situations where a teacher and a principal uh, didn't believe me when I brought Abraham Lincoln's cane in for show and tell. So if you can imagine being a, um, sure. a, a little child and people don't believe you, it's not something that you talk about very much. So I have friends that um, I went to high school with and eventually college um, that didn't know my relationship until we started doing the work um, at Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives when, when my mother and I founded it in 2007. I asked, uh, I have a, a, a Leah uh, Bundles on there from Madam C.J. Walker. Her family did all they could to not bring it up almost. Yeah, to to shelter them from that that talking about it 
for the pressure of it or something mm -hmm. like that? Did you ever yeah, that feel was, that? Yeah, that was the same in our family too. Um, and that was part of the reason that I was decisively disengaged from my lineage. In addition to people not believing me, I had also seen what the pressure had done to those that came before me. And, um, and it, it's, you know, if you can imagine growing up in this long, vast shadow of these two great and influential people, uh, you, you definitely feel the pressure. And I, I tell the story, we spent a lot of time in schools. Um, we do human trafficking prevention education in K through 12 schools. So I'm, I'm constantly in the classroom. Well, prior to COVID, I was in the classroom in person and it's been virtual um, over the past couple of years. But I tell the story about spending my summers in that beach house and at the top of the stairs was this larger than life portrait of Frederick Douglass. And I remember one night I was probably about five or six years old and, and I didn't understand his whole uh, photographic legacy that I talked about earlier. I didn't know that he was deliberate and intentional in the way he presented himself. He said, when you look at a picture of me, you're never going to deny that I'm a man worthy of freedom, worthy of citizenship. And he said, I never want to look like a happy, amiable fugitive slave because he's trying to counteract the notion in the public consciousness that people of African descent were not worthy of freedom. And you had those that were pro-slavery and the federal government making a group and other to justify enslaving them, taking away their humanity, exploiting them and brutalizing them. And he was also trying to counteract the negative caricatures that were out there that showed black people as less than human. And so I remember looking at that portrait. And if you think of, if you think about the photographs of Frederick Douglass, you see him looking right directly into the camera with that yeah. steely glare, that fiery gaze. Yeah. And as a kid, I never understood that. And I remember looking at that portrait and thinking, man, you look mean. Yeah. And I'm glad I didn't know you. And as I would try and sneak past him, his eyes would follow me. And by the time I would get down to the end of the hallway, I could feel that steely glare burn, burning like fire on the back of my neck. And I also yeah. always imagined in my little boy imagination, this booming baritone bellowing down. And he would say, you will do great things, young man. And so I started to feel the pressure around five or six years old. And I'm thinking, hmm, who, me? <laughs> I don't want anything to do with this. Yeah. Um, do, do, you, do, you, do you have a picture with him out of uh, not in a suit. Yeah, they're they're they're. Uh, if you look at the photographs, the book picturing Frederick Douglass, which was published first in 2015, and then the um, second edition, the soft cover, came out in 2018. And if you look at most of the pictures, he's in a suit. But there are some some um, photographs where he's um, in more of a, a little bit of a casual setting in a group setting, but he was always dressed to the nines. You yeah, know, he was, hair, he his, was. His hair was together. He was a fashion setter. He was a trend setter. Uh, he was way before his time and he would change his hairstyles um, and he would grow his beard, a goatee, a beard, even had mullets at one point. He went to uh, Paris, France and he came back and he was dressed kind of like a Parisian and he had a ponytail. Really? Uh, so he, he was, yeah, yeah, he was... Uh, he was really uh, way ahead of his time. So now, so you grow up like this and you don't necessarily use that. Do, do you do extra research? Did you write a paper in grade school? <laughs> hey, my granddad this and that kind of thing? Or well, did you try to kind of get away from that and, and go in the other directions of who you found your information about? Yeah, well, it was a combination of all of that. You know, I when I was in school, we were given a whitewashed narrative of history and where people of African descent and Native American descent were placed in inferior positions by design to prop up white supremacy. And so if we did get Black history uh, during Black History Month, it was just small paragraphs of the same people. It was Martin Luther King, it was Frederick Douglass, it was yeah, Rosa it's Parks, right but there. it wasn't a whole lot of information, yeah. um, at least in, in the books, the textbooks that we had. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think I ever, um, I don't remember writing a paper about them when I was younger, but when I finally decided to step into my own shoes and, and embrace this legacy, uh, that happened in 2005 when I read a National Geographic magazine and the cover story was 21st century slaves and it was an article about human trafficking and modern day slavery existing all over the world. Prior to reading that article, I was a su successful businessman. I owned my own advertising and marketing company, okay. which 
uh, cater to the travel industry. Um, I'm a husband and a father. I have two okay. daughters who now are 26 and 23. Yes, and so I was happy good. just being a businessman and a father. You go to church on Sunday. Don't talk to me about this, this legacy. So, uh, um, Frederick Douglass, how did he grow up? Well, <laughs> he was born into slavery on the eastern shore of Maryland to an enslaved woman and a white man. And it was presumed that his enslaver was his father. Uh, let's see, he never had a pair of pants or shoes until he was about six or seven years old. He would sleep head first. In so the guy didn't place. hook him up something though, huh? Well, he was enslaved, so. Uh, yeah, but you know, sometimes the dad who's the white guy gives him a few more favors. No, well, he was a br brilliant child, um, but he did not get favors from his enslaver for sure. Um, but he did have people that helped him along the way. And I'm happy to tell you the story if you want to. Yes. Well, he, you know, as I said, he he didn't have a pair of pants or shoes and he would sleep head first in an old corn sack on cold winter nights with his feet hanging out to try and keep himself warm. Only saw his mother four or five times his whole life. That's because she lived on a plantation that was 12 miles away. So in order for her to see her son, she would have to work in the fields, picking cotton from sunup to sundown walk 12 miles in the middle of the night and spend just a few precious moments with him until he would fall asleep. And then she would have to walk 12 miles back so she could be back on the plantation by the time the sun came up. Because if she wasn't, she was most okay, likely- Okay, hold on, hold on. Now you got me thinking. Okay, so the mom lives someplace else. So he's living under the direction of the slave master. He's, he's living on their property. He's living, yeah, she's on She's on a different plantation. Right. He is, on the, his, his enslaver, had plantations all over the state of Maryland. He was the oh. largest enslaver in the state of Maryland. And so, she, yes, he was on a different plantation, but he was raised initially by his grandmother. Um, his grandmother, Betsy, that was her job on the plantation was to raise the children until they were old enough to really begin their life in manual labor. And on this plantation, that was around five or six years old. And you'll notice when I, I talk about his age, I have to use an age range because he didn't know um, his birthday. He The only record that mattered to his enslaver was his valuation on the family's accounting ledger. So he, he thought he had been born in 1817, perhaps um, after he passed away, there was some documentation that was found, um, a ledger that yeah. showed that he had been born probably in February 1818. And so when he was okay. five or six, his grandmother said, we're going to go on a long journey. And that journey was a 12 mile walk to the main plantation. So separate from where his, his mother was. And that walk took a long time, if you yeah, can imagine. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, he's okay. scared. You can't walk no faster then than you do now, I think, yeah. No, 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 well, she, his grandmother carried him much of the way when his legs couldn't carry himself. And they would finally, finally get to that plantation. He would wander off just to check out his surroundings and to look for something to eat because he was hungry. And when he turned around to look for his grandmother, she was gone and he would never see her again. So you had this little boy who, as I said, had only seen his mother a handful of times, didn't know his father. He had brothers and sisters that he had been separated from early on. They were strangers to him. So you had this little boy who was an orphan, who had no family, he had no home, and he had no country because he certainly wasn't considered a citizen of the yeah, United yeah, sure, States, sure. a slave person. So then, but then he gets some, but how does he get the education there? Because there's there are people that help him because maybe he's such, so down in the scenario uh, that there's some people that, you know, as God does, that mm -hmm. take a liking to him. Is that the way it went? Yeah, well, people recognized that he was a brilliant child. And so, but he had, he wrote, he wrote about it in his first autobiography, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave which was published first, the first time in 1845. He described an incident when he was around eight or nine years old that he described as divine providence in his favor. And that was he was chosen from among all of the children on the plantation to go to Baltimore to be the house servant for his master's family. Now, the importance of this move was he was leaving in an environment where he wasn't around people that could teach him to read and write. And he would now be in the big city. He would be around free black children and he would be around white children. But what happened most importantly, when he got there, his slave mistress, Sophia Auld, had never had a slave before and didn't know that it was illegal to teach him. Okay, and and here's- that. What's a slave mistress? What do you mean that? Well, that would be his, his owner. Um, so that, that's what they would have called them, a mistress. 
the, master the woman, and mistress. The woman. Yeah, yeah, master and mistress. But you know, today we call those people enslavers because that's what they yeah, were. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So she, um, you know, she sees him, she's teaching her son, her young son, Tommy, how to read. And alongside of Tommy is Frederick Bailey, bright-eyed and eager to learn. And this is what gets lost in the story is that he asked her to teach him. And so that's an important point to make because that is an act of self-liberation. You know, sure. the way that we've been given history, it's that a bunch of white men sat, sat around the table and freed the slaves, which was not the, only the case. Right. So Frederick, at a very young age, asked her to teach him. And so she began to teach him his ABCs, his letters. And that was all he needed was that little spark of light into his mental darkness, into his mental bondage. And the lessons continued for a while until his enslaver, his master found out about him and his name was Hugh Ald. And when he found out, he got angry and he looked at his wife, Sophia, and he looked at young Frederick and he said, you cannot teach a slave how to read and write because if you do, it will unfit him to be a slave. Now, Anthony, did you hear that message? Yeah, 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 yeah. It will unfit him to be a slave. And Frederick looked at him and he thought, hmm, if you don't want me to have this, I'm going to do everything in my power to gain it. And he understood right then and there that knowledge is power. This is a great lesson for young people today because we hear that term, they hear that term. And Frederick understood that education equals freedom. Education equals emancipation. Education equals liberation. And he would teach himself to read and write. Now, uh, and under these uh, circumstances, uh, and I guess this is the thing that I'm trying to get to here. People, in, despite that situation, they had sense. They had a brain, they could think, they can analyze, they can kind of figure out a way out of this situation because my life is not good. I'm not accepting slavery as my plight. Well, we can say that from the position that we're sitting in now, looking back through the prism of history, but think about it. If you were born into slavery- Yeah, okay, good, okay. Yeah, yeah. if you're born into slavery, that, that's all you, you know. Right. And if you're in slavery and if the federal government is saying it's illegal to teach you and legal to own you, and you don't have an education, that's why it's important. It's a great message. Again, I'll keep talking about literacy for, for young people today to understand the importance of education. So if you don't have an education and you're born into something and you're told that's what life is going to be for you, then you're not asking questions. You're not thinking critically. Yeah, right. And that's what happened to Frederick. He became unfit to be enslaved because he would teach himself to read and write, and he was very clever in the way that he went about doing it. Now, he's interacting with the children in the neighborhood, and he's trading biscuits for reading lessons with the poor white children. He's picking up a stick off the ground and scratching on the wall or in the dirt. You know, is this how you write an F? And they would say, no, Fred, this is how you write an F, and he would file it away. And as he's starting to become self-taught, he's starting to think critically about his condition and asking simple questions like, why am I a slave? Okay. And why do you own me? And then he would turn to God because one of the first books that he would purchase after the Colombian order was the Bible. And he would turn to God and he would pray for deliverance from his bondage. And he would say, God, I don't understand how my master puts on a suit every Sunday and goes to church. And then the word and the Bible and cherry pick verses and scripture finds justification to brutalize, dehumanize, rape, pillage, and plunder his property. Frederick is starting to make the distinction between what he would later call the slaveholding Christianity of the land versus the pure partial, partial Christianity of Christ. So he's thinking critically. That's why they did not want to educate them because they would start to think that there's a world outside oh, yeah, no, of the prison. I understand prison, that. I understand prison that, that like, okay, yeah. so now he's doing this and does he ever go to formal school? No, he never spends one day of his life in a classroom. And so later in life, when he becomes this white haired statesman, my great grandmother used to call him the man with the great big white hair, because that's what she remembered when she met him when he was eight years old was his great big white hair and his smile, which we never see his smile in photographs. And, um, and so she would, um, you know, meet him and talk about him. But he became the first African American nominated for vice president of the United States, the first African American US Marshal, 
first African-American ambassador and council general to Haiti, first African-American recorder of deeds in the District of Columbia, the first African-American to have a statue dedicated in his honor in Rochester, New York in 1899. And the list goes on and on yeah, and on. And sure, people would yeah. ask him, now, wait a second, listen yeah. to this. Yeah. People would ask him, they would say, where did you go to school? Where did you get your education? And having never spent one day of his life in a classroom, he would respond on occasion by saying, my diploma is written on my back. My diploma is written on my back. And that's what he was talking about was the 20 years that he was enslaved and he was brutalized and dehumanized and whipped. So it was too, okay, okay. So now you led into this as, and we're moving up the timeline. So he moves into the house with the with the with the, the white master to be the helper at the house. Uh, he does that, and now he's eighteen and nineteen. When does he make his first attempt to escape? Well, you have to back up a little bit because there's another self liberating, defining moment, a self liberation defining moment that happened in his life, and that was when he was around fifteen, sixteen. Um, he became unfit to be enslaved. You could not tell him what to do. He was becoming strong. Um, he was growing up. He was getting taller and he could not control him. And so he was sent to a slave breaker by the name of Edward Covey. And it was Covey's job to break slaves. That's what he got paid for. And so Douglas was hired out or Frederick Bailey, I should say. He's not Douglas yet. Frederick Bailey was hired out to Covey for a year. And Covey put him to work and he started to, to whip him. And then when he couldn't break him, he would whip him again. And the whippings became more frequently until he was getting whooped every single day. And after six months, Frederick had had enough and he decided that he was going to fight back. And he and Covey had this epic two hour battle. Um, there was more of a wrestling match than the fisticuffs because Frederick was strategic. He was smart. He knew that if he would have killed or really hurt Covey badly, that he might have face the same fate. And so they're wrestling. If you could just get this visual of these two, um, you know, young Frederick teenage boy and this slave breaker. And after two hours, Frederick defeated Covey and he stood up and he would write about this later that the feeling that he had was, he said, you have seen how a boy has been made a slave. Now you see how a slave has been made a man. Mm. And he was with Covey another six months and Covey never touched him again, never laid another finger on him. And not only that, because he had this reputation for breaking slaves, he didn't want it to get out there that this young boy had yeah. beaten him down. And so now Frederick, while he knew he was not physically free from the chains that bound him, he was on his way to being mentally free. And he knew that one day he would attempt to escape. Why didn't the guy just kill him? Because I hear all kinds of stories. If they, they, they don't like you enough, they just, oh man, he'll go out there and kill you, put you in the bucket or nails or something like that. He got well, lucky that that didn't happen. Um, not necessarily, not, probably luck played some part in it. Whatever, but he was, yeah. He was worth something. So he oh, was, really? remember, he's hired out. So Covey cannot, send a dead body back when Frederick's value, when Frederick finally purchased his freedom from his enslaver, it was $711 in 1847. That would be probably close to $40,000 today. So imagine if Covey would have killed Frederick and sent him back to the person that he oh, hired hey, him out I from. got you there. I yeah. got you. Now, I got a story that Frederick Douglass escaped by using somebody's ID. That's right. Yeah. Well, with the help of my great, great, great grandmother, Anna Murray Douglas, and I want to take a moment to talk about her yes, please. because there would be no Frederick Douglas without Anna Murray in his life. She's, they, she's who to him? Well, she was married to him for 44 years. They met while he was enslaved as a teenage boy in Baltimore. Uh, she was the first person in her family to be born free. And so she was working as a domestic servant in Baltimore, and they lived about a street apart from each other. Um, and they met at some point. They were also born um, on the eastern shore of Maryland, not too far from each other. So there are some scholars and historians that believe that they may have met before Baltimore. And there are other historians that will say yeah. that they met in Baltimore, but okay. we don't really know exactly how they met. But the, they, they met. And that's yeah. the important part. And she was one of the first people to plant the seed of thought in his mind that Frederick, you're not meant to be a slave for life. And as they started to think about having a family together, she said, Frederick, I don't want our children's father to be a slave. 
And had she not sold her personal belongings to help finance his escape, had she not sewn the sailor's disguise that he would wear, who knows if he would have had the courage or the wherewithal to run away. And had that not happened, we would be a very different country sitting here today. Yeah, sure. Had we not had the contributions. Now, historians have not treated Anna with the dignity and respect that she deserves. As I said, they were, they were married for 44 years. They had five children together, 21 grandchildren. She was a conductor on the Underground Railroad out of their house out of Rochester, New York, where she helped to ferry hundreds of freedom seekers to their freedom in Canada. And we spent a lot of time talking about her because she is very important. And I am just as proud of her yeah, as I am of sure. Frederick and as I am of Booker, Booker T. Washington. Yeah, so sure. he would disguise himself as a sailor, carry with him identification papers of another sailor. Right. And then he would escape at the age of 20 on September 3rd, 1838 by train and by boat. Yeah. He would land in New York City, taste freedom for the first time, write a letter back to Anna, and she would come and join him. They would get married. Um, they would take on the name Frederick and Anna Johnson. And with the help of conductors on the Underground Railroad, it was suggested that they go to New Bedford, Massachusetts, because Frederick had acquired a skill as a ship caulker on the docks in Baltimore, and he could get work in New Bedford. So two weeks later, they get to New Bedford. He changes his name to Frederick Douglass to make it harder for his enslaver to track him down, and they would begin their lives together. How, how tall was he? Well, he was said, you, you know, it depends on who you talk, talk yeah. to. Uh, I've heard people say that he was 6'2 to 6'4, yeah. um, which would have been very tall back then. But yeah, right. I participated in um, a statue unveiling at the Maryland State House a few years ago. And my hands are a part of the statue. And I went to the, to the artist's uh, warehouse in Brooklyn to get my hands cast. And I was asking um, the artist if he knew how tall he was. And he said that he believed that Frederick was five feet, uh, three quarters inches uh, based on measuring his clothes uh, for, for the statue. And then a good friend of mine who is a That's Douglas sure. family historian and, and scholar, her name is Celeste Marie Bernier. She's a, a professor at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And she has studied the family extensively. And she has um, a letter, I believe, but where he wrote down his height at five feet three quarters and five excuse me five eleven and three quarters. oh yeah five three that's short yeah, yeah i'm sorry five eleven and three okay quarters. yeah i can see him being that there just under six feet yeah so now he all this uh and then how does he get started to be great well, well what's he, the first thing that led on to the journey for i mean i would say you know, he, he gets got, his freedom and now he's speaking and or it's the new no, i would go back to, i i would i would give him his mother credit for um the four or five times that she saw him and it was said that his mother was literate and perhaps might have been the first person to introduce the idea of education into his mind so in my opinion that's when he yeah. began to be great or perhaps when he was born, he began yeah, to be yeah, great yeah, because yeah, sure. you know he yeah. was he was truly an American prophet, and um, you know it was he was chosen in my mind and in a lot of a lot of people. What, what I mean by that is okay. So now he's twenty. He, he gets when is how old is he when he gets married? They got married. So he escaped when he was twenty. So he's twenty years old when he got married. Okay. Um, they go to New Bedford, Massachusetts. They okay. start to have a family together, and then when he was about twenty-two or twenty-three. He and Anna attended a, an anti-slavery meeting on Nantucket Island, and they were just in the audience. And it was run by um, supporters of the abolitionist movement, the Garrisonians, William Lloyd Garrison, uh, the white abolitionists. And when they, they heard that they had this fugitive slave in the audience, in Frederick Douglass, they asked him to stand up and just tell a story. And so he writes again in his first autobiography how nervous he was at first time speaking in front of a white audience. Now he had been honing his skills while enslaved speaking in the church. He became a licensed preacher in the AME church. Um, so he had some skills in being in front of the black audiences, but okay. this was the first time he was going to be in front of a white audience. And he wrote in his autobiography, he said, I was so nervous that first time speaking in front of that group that I was shaking from every limb. Yeah, sure, sure. But when he stood up, he had this natural gift for communication. He was eloquent, he was charismatic, he was theatrical, and he was even funny in some of the descriptions of the characters that he came into contact with while he was enslaved. 
And so the, the Garrisonians and William Lloyd Garrison in particular understood that they had this star on their hands. And so they asked Frederick or they hired him to be a paid lecturer for the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. And he began to travel. He would go from town to town, city to city, just telling his story. And the importance of what he was doing at that time was he was really the first person that had been enslaved that could communicate the inhumanity of slavery and what he had been through in a way that nobody before him had ever done. Okay. And so it really started to help people in the North understand that what slavery was really about. Because again, going back to those that were pro-slavery and the federal government making justification, they would say things like, they're better off in slavery. Yeah. They're getting the Christian religion, listen to the happy songs that they're, they're singing. And so now Frederick is coming out and he's telling, giving them the real story. Okay, I love it. Doing it in a very compelling way. When, 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 and so he does this. When, when is the newspaper? Newspaper is after he comes back from Europe. So, so, so what he's doing at the time where he's speaking out, he starts to have a problem. And that problem is people started to doubt that he was ever enslaved because they oh, couldn't really? wrap their minds around what they thought a slave looked and sounded like and what they were hearing in Frederick Douglass. So in order to prove that he was who he claimed to be, he wrote that first autobiography, The Narrative. And in it, he named names and he named places and it shows you the courage that he had. And now he had another problem. And that problem was it became a bestseller. And that's the last thing that you want is the notoriety of a best-selling book if you're yeah, trying sure. to hide from your enslaver because it made him a household name. It made him an instant celebrity. So it was suggested that he go to Europe for a couple of years as kind of a cooling off period. And while he's in England and Ireland and Scotland, he's talking about the abolition of slavery in the United States. And he's, he's, he's pulling together supporters and, and raising money. And then he would land in this place called Newcastle upon Tyne and with the help of his abolitionist friends that raised money uh, to purchase his freedom from his enslaver for, as I said, $711 or 150 pounds. So the guy is still looking for him all this time. Almost. Oh, yeah. Well, he knows. I mean, he's, he's not only looking for him, he's outraged because right. he's been named. And he's <laughs> Frederick named him in the book, along with all the other people that okay. brutalized and murdered, um, you know, his 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 people okay and so yeah they 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 knew where he was and so you know he purchased his freedom he comes back to the united states he and the family move by now they had moved from new bedford to lynn massachusetts where, where he, he wrote the book and then he moves the family to rochester new york begins to publish the north star newspaper which as you know became the leading abolitionist yeah, voice right. and a mouthpiece for for his people who were Right. And so now it, it, all this begins to happen. And then he gets so big, he meets with the presidents and, and changes Lincoln's mind about the scenarios of the time. He becomes an advisor to President Lincoln. And he was he and the other abolitionists were very important because we, if we know our Lincoln history, we know that he was very slow to move toward the abolition of slavery and that he didn't necessarily continue uh, believe that black people were equal to white people. And so the importance of what Frederick Douglass was doing and many others, but Frederick Douglass as the leading voice was to convince Lincoln that they, he could not wait to free people that were enslaved. Um, so Lincoln would eventually announce on September um, 1st, uh, 1862, that he was going to sign a document, the Emancipation Proclamation, and 100 days later, he signs it January 1st, 1863. And that document freed those only that were enslaved in the states that were in rebellion to the right. union, only did, in the Confederate states. Did, did he, did, what, was he, did he, could he travel freely during his times? Uh, because uh, other than the, than the slave catchers looking for him, were there white people who wanted to get rid of him? And he oh, ran yeah, into absolutely. businesses like that? Yeah, absolutely. If, if, you, if you study his history and, and places where he spoke, you know, there were many occasions where he was attacked. Um, there was one occasion in oh, really? Pendleton, Indiana, where he was speaking and a mob attacked him and broke his hand, which was dis disformed the rest of his life. And some of, in most of the photographs, he actually hides his, it was his writing hand, his right hand. 
he hides his hand in, in most of the pictures because his hand never healed properly. And so, yeah, he, there were, he describes fights. I mean, he was, it, it was a miracle that he wasn't assassinated because people- He, yeah, he people and the wife, uh, Anna, uh, right? I guess I got the name. You said that the news doesn't give, treat her fairly. Can you say why? It's it, it, mainly white historians um, have not treated her, in my opinion, and my family's opinion, with the dignity and respect that she deserves. Um, she, she never learned to read and write, um, and, and they treat her as if that was the only thing that she was about, let alone that she raised a family. Uh, when he was out on the road, she yeah, took care I mean, of the I, finances. I, I don't get into her personal piece like that. I don't right. Know. And, and so, you know, you have, to, you have to look at the lens with which these historians are looking through. And, um, you know, for, for whatever reason, I mean, there, there are lots of reasons. I mean, yeah. she, was all, she, was, she was a dark-skinned woman. And, and oh, some, historians, some historians will, um, you know, even go so far as to say that she was not worthy of the great Frederick Douglass. Now, you can't be married for 44 years, have all yeah, those children right. together, and, and not have a very special relationship. Yeah, and right. So, so we, we, I'm happy to say that she's starting to get her due. Um, during Frederick Douglass's bicentennial, which was in 2018, it was a 200th anniversary of his birth. Mm. Uh, we did a, a great celebration and, and project in Rochester where we erected statues of Frederick Douglass, temporary statues of, okay. of him all over the city. I think there are 13 of them. And the school that sits on the site where their homestead was, the Douglass family home before it was burned down by fire, which forced them to move to Washington, D.C. That's the reason that they wanted to wasn't fire down. set by somebody else, was it? So it was set, it was arson. It was set by somebody else. Oh, but there's, really? a school, there's a school that sits on that site. And in 2018, that school was renamed the Anna Murray Douglas Academy. Okay, I love it. Did, okay, so since we're going down this, we're going to take too much time. But then they divorce and he gets with the white lady, right? No, they didn't divorce. She passed away in their home. Oh, really? In to Maryland. And, and two years later, later um, he marries Helen Pitts. After a year-long depression and mourning um, Anna's loss, um, it was something that was very hard for him to get over. Um, yeah, I, I think it's you know people like to talk about he left Anna for the white lady. That's, that's what they. That's what I, I kind of. I thought that's what the the, the the trooper said at the house. No, that's that's not accurate. Yeah. But she was a she she worked for him and that kind of thing. Yeah, she was an abolitionist. Her. Um, her um, she was an abolitionist and she worked as a, an assistant for him and they wound up falling in love. And, and if you can think about, you know, this man that had been through so much in his life, um, there's nobody that was going to tell him who he could love. Yeah. But did he get heat from the from the black community for that? <laughs> yeah, they, they both got heat. He certainly got heat from the black. I'm community. thinking so. He, he got heat from the white community. He got heat from some of his children, but he was in love with who he was in love with. Yeah, yeah, that that's how that goes. So, so then, uh, how many kids did he he and uh, he and the second wife didn't have any kids? No, they didn't have any children. And the first wife, they had five kids. Five, yeah. Do you know any of them? Their their stories? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. They were a radical freedom fighting collective. Again. Oh really? You know, historians look just at Frederick Douglass, but he could not have done the work not only without Anna but without his children. His, his sons, um, including my great-great-grandfather, Charles, the one that founded Highland Beach, uh, they used to help with the typesetting for the North Star newspaper. Their older daughter, Rosetta, helped to edit and write articles for her father in the newspaper. The children interacted with um, Harriet Tubman and many other freedom fighters. And there are a couple of books. I, I mentioned Celeste oh, Marie really? Bernier. Oh, okay, I love it. got a couple of books that will be coming out soon. Um, where she has transcribed more than a thousand letters between family members and other um, historical documents to tell the story of the Douglas family, the entire family, uh, because okay. the fa in addition to Anna, the rest of the family has been pushed aside for the most part in history too, and, and that's not the case. They were a very important part of um, all it. of this. Did he have hobbies? Was he a nice, warm guy? Yeah. You know, he said oh, yeah. he was kind of comical. 
when he was off the road, he like did he play golf or anything like that? He, well, he loved he loved baseball. Oh, um, he? He, he had a lot of hobbies. He was truly a Renaissance man. Uh, when he was in in Ireland, in Scotland, he walked by a a store and he saw a fiddle or a violin in the window, and he loved the the Irish music and the Scottish music. And he was he just he wrote that he was kind of down and out this one day and he bought this fiddle and then he went into a room and in three days taught himself to play well enough that he would play in front of people. And then he taught my great grandfather, Joseph, his grandson, how to play the violin and Joseph became a concert violinist. He played in the White House a few really? times. He toured around the world. He became the first black classical recording artist for the Victor Talking Machine Company. So Frederick was a great teacher too. He had a lot of hobbies. I mentioned photography. He would um, play baseball with the, the kids in the neighborhood in the Anacostia neighborhood of Washington, DC. Um, he was funny. He had a great sense of humor. He sang. Um, he, had, he had a dog, they had pets. Oh man, um, okay. So yeah, he was, he was a fun loving guy. So imagine, yeah. Remember, I described him as an orphan who had no family. And so just imagine any of us, if we one day have a family, yeah. tw including 21 grandchildren, he used to get down on all fours and let his grandkids get horseback rides yeah, on his yeah, back. Yeah, and they, deal, yeah. they would grab his hair as the reins. Yeah. And what a, grand, what a granddaughter is like to do with hair. So he would sit there and, and let them braid his hair with colorful ribbons. And so he was very loving uh, man and, and loved his family. Who, who was his running buddy? Did he oh, have a yeah. guy that kind of ran with that was in the, in the movement like him? Uh, yeah, he had a lot of, Is that the same time, that kind of guy? He, he had a lot of uh, running buddies throughout his, his career. Now, he had a 50-year plus public career. And in fact, the first uh, photograph of him that was known to have been taken was when he was about 22. And the last one was taken on his deathbed the day after he passed away on February 20th, 1895. Uh, he, he published the North Star newspaper with Dr. Martin Delaney. Um, so he had a lot of people that, that he ran with, but he also had to have a close tight knit circle as well too, because of the danger that was out there and the people that wanted to get to him. Oh, really? Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Did, I mean, so he, was there an organization that he started? Uh, he started a number of organizations. Um, he was very um, into um, state uh, voting rights in in Washington D Washington D.C. Okay. And um, he started. Yeah, I don't I don't remember them off yeah, the top yeah, of my yeah. head, but he's he started a number of organizations. Did he? He grew up not far from Harriet Tubman. They were born both in the eastern shore of Maryland, not too far from each other. Now, she was a little younger than he was, but okay. I believe that they were born, they were probably born about six miles, six to eight miles apart from each other. Uh, let, let me go back to who he ran with. Who, who was a part of his era? Uh, a civil rights leader, not civil rights, but, you know, abolitionist. Is John Brown in that same time? I mean, uh, that kind of yeah. thing. Who, who, was, who was running around and being yeah, like John, he is? Yeah. Man? John Brown spent time at the Douglas home in Rochester. Um, John Brown tried to convince Frederick Douglass to come with him to Harper's Ferry. And thank goodness um, my ancestor didn't make that choice or he would have um, probably been hung or killed um, in that attack. And so, yes, there were lots of people that were around and, and he had to have a lot of supporters too, financial supporters like Garrett Smith. Uh, there were people that helped support the, the, the North Star newspaper financially. And so just like anybody today that has some sort of a business entity, uh, you can't do it by yourself. And he yeah, certainly right, can't right. do it by himself. As uh, well. Just a few more. So now he, does he, does book, is Booker T. Washington during this same time? He's a generation behind. So, so Booker T. Washington benefited from the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. And he was nine years old when he was freed. And he uh, was in Virginia. And then the family would move to West Virginia. He would work in the salt and coal mines of West Virginia because he wanted to begin his lessons during the day and his, his um, school lessons. And so he would work at night. And one night when he was in the mines, he heard these two older gentlemen talking about this place called Hampton Institute in Virginia. And they were talking about it as a place where formerly enslaved people could go and get an industrial education. 
Now, Booker had no concept of what that type of education meant, but what he was hearing from these men, he thought Hampton must literally be heaven. And so at the age of 16 years old, when he finally saved enough money and with the help of community members, he would make a 500 mile walk to go to school. And that walk took a long time, as you I'm can sure. imagine. He ran out of money on several occasions. He would take odd jobs along the way. He slept outside, he slept under bridges. There was nothing that he wouldn't do. There was no obstacle or challenge too great for him to overcome to make it to Hampton. And he would finally get to Hampton, go straight to the headmistress of the school and say, I wanna to go to school here. And she looked at him and his clothes were dirty and he was disheveled from that long journey. And she said, you're not worthy of admittance into this institution, go on about your business, young man. But he wasn't going, going to take no for an answer. So he came back the next day, she shooed him away. He kept coming back and coming back until finally um, she, she, she had enough and she said, okay, I'm going to give you an opportunity to prove yourself. There's a dirty classroom down the hallway, go and clean that and let's see what you can do. Well, he had learned the value of hard work in, by working in those mines, and he was now going to put th those to the test. And so he cleaned and he cleaned. And when he was finished, she finally came in to do, you remember they used to do the white glove test back in the day? Mm -hmm. And she's looking for dirt on the windowsills and the chairs and the tables. And not only couldn't she find dirt, she couldn't find a speck of dust. And so she looked at him and she said, you've proven yourself worthy of admittance into this institution. Not only that, we're going to give you a job as a janitor. And so he worked his way through college. He would start at 16, graduate four years later, come back to Hampton as a teacher. And in 1881, he got word that there was this group of people down in this place called Tuskegee, Alabama, that had some money to start a school. They got word that Booker T. Washington at Hampton was their principal, their, their man for the job. Booker accepted it. He rushed down to Tuskegee, ready to get started. Uh, he's looking around for an old schoolhouse or church somewhere where he could begin his lessons, but there was nothing but dirt, farmland, as far as the eye could see. But he didn't get discouraged. He started recruiting students, getting them excited about getting an education, and he would teach them skills. And one of the skills that he taught them was how to make bricks. And that was so that they could build their own school. So if you do a Google search, mm -hmm. students at Tuskegee building their school, you'll see them out there in the hot sun building their school brick by brick by brick. And that's how badly these formerly enslaved people wanted an education. And again, I'll say it, a great mes message for young people today. And so Booker T. Washington really was a person that bridged the gap between the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation and the Civil Rights Movement. And he also understood that education at Tuskegee needed to start with the basics. You couldn't start reaching for the higher aims in life he felt until you could start meet, meeting your basic needs in life. And so right. education, sometimes at Tuskegee started with hygiene, but what he was doing was he was teaching them a skill, a trade so that they could participate in the nation's growing economy. Because uh, that leads into that, but there were some other people thinking he could have taken another perspective though, Booker T. Yeah. Because he was treating uh, on, on the, the trades and there were others saying let's do more than that right and there was a little budding heads maybe yeah there uh, you know i a lot of times people think that they're just one way to do something so right. you know w.e.b du bois yes they had a, a debate um you know du bois believed in higher education and reaching for the higher aims in right. life. Right. but they the both of their philosophies were right they both had the same end goal and that was the right. advancement of their people. So right. Booker T. Washington worked from the ground up and Du Bois worked from the top down and right. advancement met in the middle. But of course they're gonna have different ideas yeah, yeah, because Booker T. Washington was born into slavery. He came from the fields with a till under his arms. Du Bois was born free in the right. city and he came from the city with books under his arms. So they, they had different life experiences. And of course, they're going to have different philosophies yeah, on right. how to advance their people. Growing up, you, you, you know what you're talking about. How do, how do you know what you're talking about in regards to, did you do extra research? Did you and the family yeah. sit around one day at the dinner table and <laughs> share some stories? I know you did extra research, but... Yeah. Uh, and you read his books and things, but have you also been a researcher to find all these good stuff that you're telling us? 
a combination of, of a lot of things. Okay. And yes, there were stories that were passed down at, at the dinner table for sure. But, you know, there was never a time when someone sat me down and said, hey, we've got something really important to tell you. I just- Oh, really? Always... There was not? Oh, really? No, because I, I, I just, the images of my ancestors were everywhere. I was young, five, six, seven years old when I started to notice that they were on statues and they were on money and postage stamps and schools were named for them, bridges were named for them, libraries, and everywhere I turned, I could see them. I would open my Encyclopedia Britannica and their faces were staring back at me, you know, making sure that I was doing, doing my work. Yes. So I was not, I would not consider myself a Douglas or a Washington scholar, but when we started doing this work, when I founded the organization with my mother, the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives in yes. 2007, I had to be a quick study and um, go back. I and I had read Frederick Douglass's narrative. I had read Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery, which was published in 1901. And I, I knew their stories. Just, just a couple more. Um, and I thank you for coming on Strong Inspirations. I'm still, my mind's still blown. <laughs> do you do a lot of this? Do, uh, are you not putting yourself out there so that uh, CNN and, and, and you know, uh, uh, the View and all of them can interview you for Black History Month. I, I, is that also part of what you now want to accept for yourself? The most important thing to me is the work. Frederick Douglass said it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And our mission is to build strong children and to end systems of exploitation and oppression. Uh, Booker T. Washington said, if you want to lift up yourself, lift up someone else. So I was in the Abraham Lincoln uh, three-part miniseries on History Channel. I encourage people to watch that. Yes. It's very well done. I was also in the um, HBO documentary, Frederick Douglass and Five Speeches. You can stream that on HBO Max. I encourage yes. people to watch that. Yes. And then I was also in an episode of 1,000 Years of Slavery. Uh, my episode aired on February 28th on the Smithsonian Channel. And uh, you can stream that on the S Smithsonian Channel website. Okay. So there are opportunities that that pop up. We're also yeah. working on media projects. I'm working on a feature film about Frederick Douglass with a oh, very really? prominent actor and prominent cast. We're not announcing that publicly yet. So uh, perhaps I can come back on and I can yeah, tell oh, you. Oh, shoot, heck yeah. <laughs> months, working on a limited TV series about Frederick yes. Douglass. And then also we have a musical about Frederick Douglass that will debut at the arena stage in Washington, D.C. on July 15th that is, was created by my friend Marcus Humman, who wrote the book and is a composer, and then my friend Charles Randolph Wright, who is also uh, worked on the book, and he's a director. So mm -hmm. there are lots of things that are in the works. I'm also working on my book, uh, finally. And oh, really? That'll be in the bookstores. Uh, sometime next year yeah. and, and a whole lot of other things we've got yeah, so much i love it on. so yeah that's a beautiful thing um uh, uh how, how you feel uh, knowing this how you feel you know telling these stories and, and that kind of thing it, it, it makes you proud i'm sure but what does it do for you let's say yeah that's a great question i you know there are days when i pinch myself and think you know god why is it that you chose me to carry yes. this lineage? And I have the blood of these great American heroes flowing through my veins. So I feel honored and I'm incredibly proud. I'm, I'm proud of the work that my ancestors did as we all should be proud. Yes. One more question. And this is, is, it's kind of funny like this. Did you ever see a jacket that he wore, a hat, some shoes? What I mean, uh, papers that he wrote that the family still kept, or what did they do with those things that, that, that they archived to? Yeah, well, my great grandmother, Fanny, that I've ta been talking about, she yeah. was the matriarch of the Douglas family, and a lot of the artifacts were passed down through her. And she would put things on loan to the Library of Congress, to the Smithsonian, to the Frederick Douglass home. And back then, you know, it was just off of trust, there, there was no paperwork. And as she started to get older, I mentioned she lived to be 103 years old and she didn't remember where all of these things were. And so a lot of artifacts didn't make it back to us. But I truly believe that many of these items will find their way back to us because we are building in Rochester, New York, the Frederick Douglass Museum Center, which is going to be a world-class destination oh, really? where people can come through the Frederick Douglass Airport 
in Rochester, which we helped to get that renamed in his honor, and then visit this museum. It's about a four or five year project before it will be completed. And I believe a lot of these artifacts will make their way back to our family and into that museum. And some of them have started to make their way okay. back to us. I've got artifacts in my closet. I've got Frederick Douglass's reading glasses in a in a diary that he carried around during oh, the Civil War yeah, in his pocket. Yeah. I've got behind me a proclamation from the Church of England. Yeah. My mother has lots of photographs, yeah. uh, family photographs that have been passed down. Okay. And so um, okay, it's, it's kind you. of bitter, it's bittersweet. You know, sometimes I'll see these artifacts or photos in private collections. And, you know, I, I'm just appreciative that people are caring for them and that they're out there in the pub public so people can feel and touch and, and learn about the lives of my ancestors. And perhaps if they're just sitting in my closet yeah. or under a bed, then yeah. they're not gonna have the same type of impact. You talked about the, uh, the organization. Do you wanna give that website for people? Can we help you somehow donate? Yes. Uh, be a, you know, the programming that you do, whatever. We can do it through the website. What's the website's name? The website is fdfi.org. Uh, that's the acronym for Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives, fdfi.org. And when you go to the website, you're going to see um, a new partnership that we've just announced with the History Channel. Uh, we've got a project called One Million Abolitionists, and we republished a special bicentennial edition of Frederick Douglass's narrative, that first autobiography. And we're working to give away 1 million copies uh, to young people everywhere, young people students so don't don't call yeah, us up and yeah, say hey can sure, you send sure. me one uh, but if you want to help us get the, these books into your local schools or your local um, organizations uh, boys and girls clubs you know why why ywca ymca those types of places that serve um, youth population that would benefit from okay. frederick Douglass's story and so we're really honored to be working with the history channel on that uh, to date We've um, reached almost 100,000 books given out, so we're a long way from the million, but we're, we'll, we're going to get there with the help of individual donors. So if you yes. feel that you want to contribute to the project, you can do that as well. And then just take a look at all of the other projects that we're working on too. As I said, we've got a lot going on. Yeah. Uh, with that said, um, I guess I just, uh, off the cuff, is there a question that I have not asked you? You know, I mean, we covered a lot. Is there something that you normally tell people? Like, what was his favorite saying? Did he have a slogan? Did he have a popsicle that he liked? Did he <laughs> a sucker that he, was he a smoker? Any of those kind of things and that, you know? Yeah, no, no, not a smoker. Um, you know, but he, if you go to his home and I, I love this, the um, National Historic Site in, in Washington. And if you look in the dining room, you'll see chairs around the dining table. And you'll notice at the head of the table, the chair has wheels on it. And so, of course, you know, I asked, well, why are there wheels on this chair? And, and the docent of the park ranger said, well, that's because he, Frederick was so animated when he would tell stories and his hands would fly all over the place and he would be knocking over the glasses and knocking dishes off the table. So with the wheels, he could push away from the table and then tell his story without knocking stuff okay, over. So he was, he was quite, quite a character, but he had, he, he was all about words. He, he wrote thousands of articles and essays. He published three best-selling autobiographies. He wrote a, a fiction book called The Heroic Slave. And so he had lots of sayings and lots of quotes, and, and many of those have been written down. Man, man, thank you so very much for coming on the channel. My pleasure. Oh, my God, everybody, this is what we do with Strong Inspirations. We give it to you straight. No <laughs> chase, I get through the Man, I'll tell you, this has become my calling. I get to the right person and let them tell it. I thank you for coming on the channel. Everybody hit the subscribe button sooner or later. Hit the like button on this video right now. Hit the notifications bell for when the other videos come up, you get notified and tell somebody about strong inspirations. Don't keep it to yourself because we're going to keep giving it to you. You heard what he said. I'm going to hold him to it. He said he'll come back on and whenever he wants to. I just told him name the day and time and I'm there no matter what I'm doing. And also uh, support the uh, the foundation. See, because uh, let, let me say this to y'all that's watching. 
what he said was, he put this in me, took me a few years, and here I am. And now I have exploded in my own way on the scene. I'm doing international things and museums and all that, him and his mom and the people that they have built to help move that train along. And it is going down the track. So to you, my brother, I say this with all sincerity, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, I want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind. I'm loving what you're doing. And, 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 and your mom tell her I said that too, and everybody else at the foundation, that in your own way, you found your niche. And here we go. And it's happening and things are moving and giving away books and all that good stuff. That's good things. Not everybody gonna be written up as famous, but they're the people like him that do the work and get to their claim in their own way. We know about it now. So uh, to that, I say thank you for coming on the channel. I really appreciate it. I can't wait to meet you in person. I'll be honest with you. Tell everybody, I know that. Bye-bye, uh, we out. Thank you, Anthony. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right.